marine biology, obviously fascinated with the sea. He's had his photographic work published in several magazines and newspapers, including BBC Wildlife, Diver Magazine and Vanity Fair. And he's also won several awards, including um, British Wildlife Photography Awards. He's got a background in environmental sciences and also acts as a freelance um, marine biologist. Matt has a strong understanding of the natural world and the processes that drive it. Photography has given him the right medium to bring the species and places that share our planet to a wider audience. And I'm really looking forward to hearing how he's brought those three strands of education, science and conservation together through photography, which is a wonderful medium to really explain how important the world around us is. So Matt, over to you and thank you so much for coming to the Society. Okay, well, thanks Sandy for um, such a, a lovely introduction there. Um, it's very kind of you. Uh, thank you everyone for, for coming along today to, to listen. And, and thanks again to the Linnaean Society and, and Padma for asking me to, um, to give this, this talk today. I always relish the, any opportunity to share my images and, and some of the stories that, um, that they can tell. So um, my, my plan today is to give you a brief introduction to how I got started in photography, run through um, a short selection of some of my favourite images um, that I've taken mainly in the UK over the years, um, and then to talk in a little bit more detail about some of the projects I've worked on and how they've been able to, to contribute contribute to both education, science and conservation. So I'll start by, I mean, Sandy's already given me a, a great introduction there, but um, um, I'll introduce myself um, one more time in my, my many hats. Um, I'm a, a self-employed marine ecologist, scientific diver, drone pilot, and underwater and wildlife photographer. Now these um, <coughs> are quite different, but also um, very linked roles. And, um, and they've allowed me to work on some really interesting projects over the years. Um, as I said, some of which I'll talk to you in, in more detail about um, later on. So how did I get started in photography? I mean, my interest in photography in general um, really began as a student, but only progressed to um, underwater photography uh, following my PhD when I went to work in the Philippines on a coral reef conservation project. Um, this was my this was my office. Um, had a, a small office behind the palm trees, and my my field work um, was undertaken mainly off this um, wonderful beach here. And uh, when I went out to the Philippines, I took with me just a very small digital compact camera, um, and I'd never never taken a camera underwater before. And it was it was during that year that um, I really got to got to grips with it, and I realised that images didn't have to be just a a blunt scientific tool, but could be used to educate and inspire people at the same time if they were used in the right way. Um, this could be either showing behaviours and relationships between different species, um, or by showing people what experiences um, they could have um, underwater um, and with wildlife. So often on projects, I now find myself um, taking many different styles of images to fulfill the, these different roles that the images might have to might have to play. So back in the UK, um, I feel that still and, and all too often, um, a lot of people will look out to sea um, and they consider little more than, than just its surface. They don't always think about what's underneath. And I do still sometimes get asked, why I dive in such cold, murky waters um, that we have over here. I feel that not everyone fully understands what's around our shores. Um, and that's what inspires me to take more eye-catching images to, to change that. Um, so I'm gonna share with you now a few of my, my favorite um, images. And, and some of these have been able, I've been able to take some of these um, because of my participation in, um, in sea search diving. Um, now this is a, um, uh, a program which uses voluntary divers, um, which in reality is, is a mix of professional and, and amateur uh, marine biologists who are, are interested in, in marine life. And the scheme provides those divers with the opportunity to, to train um, in marine ID and go to some really interesting 
dive sites um, that you wouldn't normally get to go to on a standard club dive or a charter boat. You often always um, visit the same reefs and wrecks time and time again. Uh, and it's on these sea search dives that I can I can split my time between surveying the marine life that's there and taking photographs to record the species and habitats, um, not always just for scientific purposes, but to try and catch some really um, inspiring images as well. So um, onto a few of my favourites. Um, my photography really became better known, primarily due to a, a set of, of diving gannet images that I took well, some eight years ago now, back in 2012. And, and these images um, really performed very well across multiple um, national and international photography competitions. Um, and they provided a, a new insight, really, into a, a new viewpoint, into life beneath the waves for these, these masters of, um, of, of diving. And uh, you know, I was able to capture a mix of, of some quite chaotic scenes with, with loads of birds underwater all at once, um, and others which showed the species in you know in their in their grace and their, their perfect adaptation to the, the high diving uh, fishing life. So I, I really sort of benefited photographically wise from from this set of images. Um, this underwater archway was taken on a um, on a sea search expedition um, some 60 miles offshore of the Scottish west coast on the island of Sula Segir, which means granite rock. Um, and it literally is just a, a, a granite rock covered in gannets um, and nothing else. And it's um, both above and below the waves. It's one of the most visually impressive sites I've ever dived. Um, this archway itself is about 30 to 35 meters um, below the surface and, and just provided all sorts of um, opportunities for, for different photographs. But you don't always need stunning scenery um, and, and wonderful dive models and, and species to, um, to make a good image. Um, even the most simple life forms can provide quite a, a visual spectacle, such as this mauve stinger um, jellyfish. And you wouldn't believe quite how many people I've had asking me over the years of, of you know, can I take them to see these, these giant jellies? Um, when you look carefully, I don't know if my mouse pointer shows up on the screen here, but you can um, you can see how big they really are. This one in, in front of my friend Richard in the background. Um, they don't quite get as, as large as, as people might imagine. Um, these moon jellies in Loch Duick provided me with a, a diving experience I'll, I'll never forget. Um, it was like diving in some sort of primordial soup, just surrounded by thousands and thousands of these of these jellyfish the size of dinner plates. They don't sting, at least not very much, so it's nothing to um, nothing to be concerned about. And just a really enjoyable hour in the water with these with these jellyfish. And and sea locks themselves can support a huge amount of, um, of wonderful marine life. These these jellyfish filled the top uh, five or six meters of the water column while some 30 meters beneath them in almost total darkness. Um, we can find fireworks and enemies and um, frays, gobies, this one down here, which um, share its, its burrows with them, um, with long clawed squat lobsters and, um, and, and Norway lobsters. Um, and you can, all, all over this mud, you can find sea pens and all manner of different, um, different species, which really bring the, the muddy seabed to life even in almost total darkness. Again, even the most common species can provide eye-catching opportunities for images when they're, they're lit and framed appropriately. Um, this common hermit crab was sitting atop uh, dead men's finger soft coral in Loch Carr in Scotland um, and was, was very tolerant of me as I, I faffed around for 15 minutes or so trying to get the lighting just right and um, eventually managed to do that and um, he or she now adorns the uh, the front cover of the sea search guide to marine life for, for Britain and Ireland. Taking a, a giant leap um, south now to the Dorset coast this is one of my favorite fish to encounter not something you see really often but um, late winter and early spring when water temperatures are at their lowest see the arrival of lump suckers coming in shore to lay their eggs. 
Um, their eggs are visible as the, the blue patch on the rocks here, just beneath the fish. And uh, the male lump sucker will, will, will guard those eggs um, until they've hatched. Um, and they can be very dedicated parents as well, where they nest in uh, very shallow water. Sometimes the males are left exposed on a, a low spring tide to the air, um, but they will not leave those eggs until they've hatched. Um, and they're quite capable of surviving an hour or so out of the water um, during the winter months um, and, uh, and continue guarding when the tide comes back in. Lump suckers aren't to everybody's, uh, um, aren't everybody's cup of tea. Um, so if we jump to the cuter end of the scale, um, this is the Tompot Blenny, very, very common along the south coast. Um, an inquisitive little fish, very prone to photo bombing um, at any, any opportunity. This one did just that. Um, I was on a sea search dive and I was trying to photograph the, the different algal species that were around and this little chap just kept on jumping in front of my camera lens during the dive so I switched my focus to him in, or her instead of the, um, the red algae and, uh, and that fish has since adorned a few magazine covers um, over the years including uh, one of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust there. And nudibranchs or sea slugs are every macro photographer's dream. Um, they come in a, a range of, of shapes and sizes and, and colours. Um, and, and really they're a lovely subject to photograph because they move very slowly. So you've got ample time to get your, your framing and your lighting right. Um, and uh, they're always a nice little splash of colour on the seabed, like finding little, little jewels underwater um, as you're diving along. It's often nice in a, in a photograph as well to put a uh, species in the context of its habitat, giving it a sense of, of place and showing its wider environment. And that's what I'm able to do with some, some subjects like this cuttlefish, um, which is inhabiting a, a rocky reef in, in Pool Bay. So you know, you've got the, the cuttlefish nicely framed there, but in the background you can see the sponges and the algae over the rocky reefs and you understand a bit more about the species and, and where it lives. Um, the same applies for this, this shoal of bib photographed um, near Kimbridge Bay in Dorset. They're swimming over a, a kind of habitat called limestone pavement and these, these are boulders the size of uh, cars or vans. Um, they're, they're huge great big lumps of rock um, <clears throat> all separated by these these gullies with, with overhangs in between them, some of them big enough to swim through as, as a diver, but, but most not. And they're adorned with this, this lovely rich turf of red algae, sponge species and, and antenna hydroids looking almost like grass, um, like a grassy lawn across the, the top of the boulders. My photography is not always um, limited to, to UK waters. Um, uh, a couple of projects over the years have seen me um, go to some some more exciting venues um, to photograph whale sharks on on occasion and in other times um, cold waters of Tasmania um, can be incredible places to dive you don't have to go to the tropics um, and these are home to the fabulous weedy sea dragon um, this one making the, the cover of diver magazine some years back um, Unfortunately, this year, uh, the coronavirus meant I, I missed out on a chance to, to film and photograph a, a conservation project in the Galapagos, um, which was, was scheduled for, for late March, early April. So really bad timing there. Um, perhaps another year that will, will come to fruition again. Um, as I alluded to earlier, though, photography is not always just about a, a single image. It can be about telling a story. Um, and before I focus on, on those, those few projects, I said I'd, I'd give you more detail on some, some highlights now of a, of a couple of, um, of recent projects that I, I've worked on. And um, this was a seagrass translocation project um, run by um, Southampton University, uh, the National Oceanography Centre, um, working on a, a, a mitigation project down in, in Cornwall between the Fowl and, and health at estuaries and I was actually participating myself in the translocation but when when time and opportunity allowed I was, was documenting the whole process from from digging up the seagrass um, repotting it transporting it across to um, the recipient sites um, in the in the 
Helford Estuary, these areas where um, mooring chains have created scars in um, existing seagrass beds um, and replanting uh, the seagrass here to, to patch up the damage that had been done um, and then returning in, in subsequent years to um, record the success of the project. I've, um, I've helped out um, Plymouth University um, generating images and, and video um, to create outreach media um, for a bass tagging project, sea bass tagging project. Um, so they've been able to use those, those images and, and video footage um, at conferences and on social media to, to promote their work. Um, this, this image here on the left of uh, a sea bass being released um, by PhD student Tom Stamp. Um, the sea bass has just been tagged um, and has now been, been released and they were able to track, track these fish for, for several years as they moved in and out of, of river estuaries um, in South Devon. Um, and I've also worked with Somerset Wildlife Trust to create, um, again, social media um, films for their um, eel habitat restoration project in, in the Brew Valley. It's not always all underwater as well, um, as well as being able to use my, my drone to capture scenic aerial shots. Um, I've been using it to monitor interannual seagrass dynamics in the Fleet Lagoon since 2016, um, when a, a large area of, of dieback, as you can see here on the left, was was recorded um, and we've been monitoring the same area um, annually ever since and tracking the, the recovery of the seagrass over time and these 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 results and, and data get reported back to local study groups in, in natural England so they can um, see how, how the habitats are, are regenerating. But going back to the sea search diving and all of those images um, that I mentioned Many, I mean, it's, it's rare these days to find a diver who doesn't go underwater with a camera of, of some sorts. But many of these images end up on people's hard drives, um, quite often um, forgotten and not given enough of a, of a platform to shine and show people what we've got um, around our, our shores. And, and this particular project um, on Dorset's marine protected areas, I was tasked with building a website um, to change that really and, uh, and the site now shows off images and videos by by not just myself but other other divers as well um, from marine protected areas throughout Dorset and you know if you have time please please visit dorsetmpas.uk and you can learn about all these different areas the <clears throat> the underlying geology um, the habitats and species which are there um, management measures in place and, and how how the sites have been used historically um, by, by both man and nature. Um, so that was a really interesting project to work on. Um, it's not just an image gallery, you know, it's, it's a website that's there to, to really show people what wonderful marine life is off Dorset shores. And that itself led on to a, a similar project for the King Moon Marine Conservation Zone off the Sussex coast. So this is a, a web page just for one particular protected area. And that site is renowned um, for its, its breeding population of a fish called the Black Bream. Um, and the Kingmere, MCZ and its surrounding areas um, are the largest known nesting area in the UK for the Black Bream. And I was asked to, um, to, to carry out this project and, and produce the web page, pardon me, on the MCZ um, based on work I had completed in Dorset on Black Bream, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, so again, I'd encourage you to visit this website. It's not just about Breen. You'll, you'll find out all about the marine conservation zone, the species and habitats within it, um, and how it's been managed um, into the future um, to, to offer the Black Breen there a bit more protection than they had before. Okay, so I'm going to talk now um, in a bit more detail about the Black Breen project. This this is a project um, which was <clears throat> which was planned in 2013, but didn't start in earnest until 2015, following a, a complete washout in spring 2014 um, due to high winds and, and bad weather, just making diving um, impossible during the um, during the species spawning season. 
so I've worked on this project um, and uh, a couple following um, this one with them um, with two very good friends, Martin and Sheila Openshaw. Um, now Martin and Sheila are spending their retirement being active research divers in both marine biology and nautical archaeology. So we quite enjoy between us coming up with um, with different ideas for, for projects, um, mainly you know really based in, in Dorset um, and trying to tell interesting stories um, about uh, about Dorset seas. So the Dorset coast it's I mean it's an incredible place um, as you can can see here the yeah, it, it's, it's renowned for its, its fossils and its, its geological interest um, you know you take a walk along any the base of any cliffs throughout the Jurassic coast area um, and you can see the different rock layers and, and so much going on um, and you can see from this this drone image this geology continues um, underwater we've got these these rocky ledges jutting out from uh, from the shore um, there's walls and overhangs there um, it's it's an incredible place underwater to dive very 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 now each spring black bream migrate to areas along this coastline um, to to build their nests and spawn but these events have never been recorded in the wild and um, Pre, um, prior to us completing this, this project, most of our scientific knowledge about black bream and, and their spawning habits um, were really largely relying on aquarium observations from of you know half a dozen fish from the 1950s and 60s um, and on data acquired from commercial fishermen. So we wanted to find out exactly what happened in the wild during the nesting season. It's not an easy thing to do. Black bream are incredibly shy, so they're rarely seen by divers. They, they disappear as soon as you enter the water. Um, and the nest sites are not exactly top of most recreational divers' wish lists, because um, to the untrained eye, they perhaps just look quite dull and, and boring. Um, our study sites for the project have concentrated um, at uh, a number of sites around the, the Purbex in, in Dorset and, and in Pool Bay, the sites up here. Um, and both these, these areas support some, some wonderful rocky reefs, full of life and colour and uh, you know, abounding with other species. But these reefs are not where the bream nest. They nest around these reefs in really otherwise quite, quite dull and, and, and boring looking areas. Um, they like to nest over bedrock or boulders which are covered with a, a very thin veneer of gravel, sand or, or shells. And in the springtime when they arrive, the male fish will e excavate down through this, this mobile layer of sand or gravel, whatever is present on, on any suitable site, um, to get to the bedrock beneath that. So this image here is actually of an active nest site. Um, you can't see any fish because as I've just said, they're, they're very shy and I've arrived to take this photograph and they've all just, just scarpered, but you can see their nests and to give you an idea of scale, each, each of these nests is around about um, six foot, two meters or so in, in diameter. So they're, they're, they're big structures. And, and on this occasion, the whole seabed looked like a, a moonscape um, full of, full of the bream nest. So how are we going to record what the fish are doing if they disappear? Well, we had to resort to remote filming techniques. Um, uh, so we used um, a range of different cameras to capture still images and video um, over, sometimes using a simple setup like this, we could capture footage continuously over just a few hours. Um, or if we used a more complex setup, um, this is a, a homemade programmable GoPro unit um, devised by Martin, which is capable of, of being placed underwater for you know, a week or two at a time. And gathering footage at intervals throughout that period and that was able that enabled us to kind of prove that the footage we were gathering over a few hours at the time was was wholly representative of um of events throughout the day so we we put these these cameras down um this is this is you know really based over several um months and months each year for and um two or three years continuously doing this this project um, but very early on we had some some super results, you know, instantly gratifying um, to capture this mass migration of fish so early on in the project was 
it was a great step forward for us and, and gave us confidence that what we were you know planning to do was going to work um, we never thought we'd see that that many fish all, all at once um, over the nesting area so one aspect of the project has been to um, to film and photograph all sorts of, of bream nests um, in different nesting areas over different habitats um, and this this has helped us to show their diversity of form and structure so that when we're, we're giving talks like this to um, to other divers in particular we can we can show them this range of nests um, and then ask them you know if you find bream nests um, to let us know where they where those nests are and it helps the other divers um, recognize what a bream nest looks like because they're not always as obvious as they were in the, the previous image um, this particular shot um, shows a nest uh, full of eggs, full of bream eggs, this um, white patch in the middle here. And, uh, <clears throat> and the diver, my friend Nick, um, is there and he gives it a sense of scale so people can understand you know, roughly how big the, these images really are. Um, but I've also experimented recently with creating 3D models um, of, of some underwater scenes. And um, this one shows a, a, a bream nest um, which I, I've made this model from over 60 individual photographs um, of a nest from, from all sorts of angles, from top down and, and round the sides, and stitched them together in a specialist software called Agisoft. And it, it helps to show the nest structure um, as, as you would experience it in the water. Um, and I want to um, follow this up and, and build a, a similar model, but capturing a, a much wider nesting area. Um, showing showing multiple nests to give people an impression of what uh, a bream nesting site is really like. Anyway, to try and um, sum up and show you some of the highlights of the Black Bream project, I've got a short video here. It's um, a couple of minutes long and it just gives you an insight into what life is like for um, the spawning bream. So the footage we've captured early on in the, the spawning season has, has really highlighted um, the, the difficulty male fish have in, in defending their territories. They, they have to fight off other males that would, would try and, and take their nesting areas from them, um, all at the same time keeping their nest structure tidy and spick and span to bring the females down. Because when a female does arrive, she'll inspect the nest, she'll rub her, her tummy against it, she'll feel it with her fins, and we think she's, she's checking out the quality of the nest and how clean it is before she decides if she's going to spawn um, with the male. These eggs are almost ready to hatch with their eyes visible. A, a ballon wrasse who's um, trying to feed on the, the eggs on a black bream nest, but not for long.
So when we started the Black Broom project, we, we didn't really know what we were going to, to find out. We were just really being nosy. We had no um, no preconceptions of what would happen and, and no um, you know, set aims and, and targets um, for, the, for the project. So it's kind of um, evolved as it's, it's gone along. But in summary, the, the Black Broom project is, is highlighted uh, the, this vital role that the male fish plays in the reproductive strategy of the species in terms of, of nest building and guarding the eggs. Our footage has, has shown that the, the fish will spawn multiple times over a spawning season um, and for, for longer than, than previously thought um, into, into July, mid-July in, in some years. Um, we've shown that multiple habitats are vital both for, for nesting activity um, and or as nursery areas for, for the juvenile fish. And at, therefore, at, at a management level, um, the, the data we've collected um, through the project has been able to underpin strategies requiring anglers um, to return male fish to the water that they catch during the spawning season. And it's provided supporting evidence for um, seasonal restrictions on other activities like dredging, which um, can occur near other bream nesting sites. From a, from a personal point of view, I would ideally like to see commercial trawling over nesting areas uh, restricted during um, the spawning season, um, because these sorts of activities can only be detrimental to the bream's population status, um, which, given it's such a valued commercial um, and recreational species, um, there's still very little known about um, its population trends. Nobody monitors them, so um, it's, it's a very data deficient species. Um, and we're pleased that our project has been able to, to contribute towards that understanding in some ways. Um, our collection of footage and images has also allowed us to, to publish the Bream story in numerous magazines, um, diving magazines, angling magazines, etc. Um, and we've had the story featured on television programmes such as uh, BBC's The One Show, Hughes, Wild West and Blue Planet UK. Um, so we'll move on to the next project. Uh, you might recall in the video you just saw that on, on one occasion um, a ray cruised across the surface of, of a nest and that was an undulate ray um, which leads us on to the undulate ray project. Um, and each year when the black bream have finished spawning on several of our, our Dorset study sites um, the number of undulate rays uh, increases dramatically. Now the undulate ray is, is arguably the UK's most stunning ray um, with a pattern resembling something akin to Aboriginal art. Um, and it was early on in the Black Bream project, it struck Martin and Sheila that they were seeing the same rays time and time again in the same place. So they, they went back to all their photographs um, and, and proved this to be the case. And it quickly became apparent that the, the patterns on each raised dorsal surface were as unique to them as our fingerprints are to us. And you can see this in um, you know, the diversity of the, of the patterns um, in this slide. Um, you've got some rays which are very dark with minimal markings, while others are very heavily spotted and, and lined. By standardizing and simplifying the photographic technique whenever a ray was encountered, Martin and Sheila were able to, to demonstrate this beyond doubt. Um, and each ray in the Undulate Ray Project is now given its, its own unique name. So we'll use an example um, of Garay, um, which shows just that. Um, and looking at a few key areas on um, Garay's dorsal surface, um, you can confirm that uh, these images um, taken, in this case, just one month apart, um, are indeed of exactly the same fish. To identify every ray seen uh, manually is, is quite a, a time-consuming process. So Martin and Sheila turned to some freely available software online called Wild ID, and this is able to automate um, the ray identification process, um, something that became essential when the project um, went public, as it were, 
and, and ask divers and anglers for help in gathering more images um, of, of rays. And almost overnight, hundreds flooded into the, the project mailbox. And, and if it wasn't for this automated system, Martin and Sheila would probably still be processing the images now. But they now have a database of well over um, seven, maybe 800 different rays from the Dorset coast, many of which um, are repeatedly seen by divers or caught by anglers in the same localized areas over time scales of several years. So tapping into the images uh, the, to the public's image database in this way has, has really demonstrated the importance of, of local habitat and local fishery conservation measures for a species like this one, which is known to have a very low migratory potential. And the project has been made extra easy by the very tolerant nature and approachability of undulate rays, uh, particularly in comparison to say a thornback ray, which will scarper at the first uh, whiff of a diver. So this um, uh, approachability of the undulate rays made collaboration with scientists at Manchester Metropolitan University all the easier uh, when the project progressed to collecting DNA samples from rays on our, on our Dorset study site. Um, gathering DNA swabs was a very simple process. Um, and comparison of the DNA with that from undulate ray populations elsewhere in Europe and into Northern Africa has shown that rays in the, the Dorset populations are somewhat distinct from the other populations. Um, and again, as with the, the Black Bream project, this has provided you know, really strong supporting evidence for effective local conservation of a species, which you know, was recently fished to very, you know, very, very low levels in the UK. Um, so much so that um, a zero quota was, was placed on it um, and it remains threatened on a, on a global scale. This short video here shows the um, process of, of DNA sample collection um, and the, the researchers at Manchester University have been able to use this to, um, uh, uh, have been able to use this in, in various conferences and the like where they've presented their work. Amazing that the ray will will stay there. You know, there's three three divers crowding around it, taking the DNA sample, taking pictures, blowing bubbles, and it, it still hasn't moved. <laughs> so it's left undisturbed while we went in search of uh, of the next ray. Okay, so the project, um, again, it's provided the opportunity to gather a range of, of, of different images and, and video footage to, to tell the Ray's story to a, a range of different audiences. Um, as with the, the Black Bream project, uh, we've been able to produce uh, magazine articles, um, again, one in a, a diving magazine um, and others in um, Wildlife Trust magazines, photography magazines. Um, and the project um, was also featured on BBC's Blue Planet UK, um, which aired last year. So hopefully um, this presentation has opened your eyes to the many ways in which um, images can be used effectively to educate and inform the public about our marine life, contribute to sound scientific research to both increase our knowledge and understanding of species ecology and thereby underpin um, reasoning behind conservation measures um, taken to protect the species and their habitats for the future. Um, one very final project which I won't go into much detail about at all um, but just to mention my photography is not all about marine life um, and this year um, in and around lockdown um, one project is focused on a, a previously undiscovered World War II plane wreck off the Dorset coast that of a, a Messerschmitt um, heavy fighter bomber 
Um, the project's ongoing. Um, one aspect of it has been to create a 3D image of the site. One of my early attempts at that is, is here. And what provides a nice link between this and um, the other projects that you've seen today is if you look over on the right hand side, you can see these light gray patches exposed in the seabed. Um, and they are of course, black bream nests. Um, so we've got one archeological project is now meeting um, the black bream project. And uh, we might try and uh, uh, get some video and footage of bream nesting on the site um, next year. But um, if you want to know more about this shipwreck, we were um, fortunate to have it feature on the one show just last night. Um, so it's available to view on iPlayer for, for a few weeks yet. Um, if you look up last night's episode of the one show. Um, on that note, I think it's time to stop. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the talk and um, I'll hand back over to Padma, who I think has hopefully got Hi. a few questions. Yes, thanks, Matt. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, what I like is I'm so glad that the Lady Breams check out, you know, whether their prospective partners' homes are clean enough for them to, um, you know, come in and lay eggs. Um, good choice. Uh, okay, so two questions. Um, Christian Caruso has a question. Are nudie branches found on UK coasts? Yes, um, all around our coasts. Um, al almost anywhere you dive, if you know if you know where to look, um, you can you can find nudibranchs. Um, different species will will be found in in different habitats and feeding on on different things. So some species of nudibranch will feed on sponges, others on sea squirts. Some will feed on um, bryozoans or hydroids. So you know if you're, you're diving in and around these these um, different habitats, you know, you know after after a while of, of diving, you know which species of nudibranch you're likely to find wherever you look so some will stand out really obvious you know, they can be seven eight centimeters long and very brightly colored others incredibly well camouflaged but it, with a bit of practice you can find them almost anywhere around our coast right um fiona has a question how did you secure the longer term camera so it stayed in one place for weeks at a time lots and lots of lead weight <laughs> <laughs> um, so the um, the camera itself, I showed you the <clears throat> the camera and the, the the housing with all the batteries in it um, in quite an exposed perspex case. Um, it's then got a little um, woolly jacket, as it were, uh, a little um, neoprene bag to to cushion it and, and protect the, the the body of the kit. And then that gets you you really have to kind of pick and choose carefully where you're going to place it um but that gets essentially placed on um either nestled into the gravel on the seabed or on top of a boulder um and then has five or six kilos of lead strapped to it um so it, it's not going to go anywhere but we we always try to look at the long term weather forecast and not put it down if a if a gale is <laughs> is imminent um, some people want to know if your uh, Bream video is online anywhere for them to see. Yeah, um, if you, uh, that particular video, um, is that on my website at the moment? It might be. You should be able to find it on Vimeo. Um, the Bream project webpage on my my website, mattdoggett.com, does need updating. Um, but it, it is available online. Um, Great. Yeah, if you, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's uh, on my web page, but if it's not, I will. Maybe I'll, you can send me I'll a link and me. if, yeah, and then I can send it forward to people who are interested maybe sure. in watching it again. Um, there's a question from Claire. Uh, where are the seagrass nursery areas in comparison with the nest sites? And how do babies know how to go there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think they end up in their nursery areas by luck. Um, once the once the eggs on the nest hatch, the the larvae um, will will drift on the plankton for a month or more. So they're just carried by tides and currents, um, and and the, the the juvenile fish they just end up where they end up. So um, we have seen um, juvenile bream in Studland Bay, in Swanage Bay. Um, in the Fleet Lagoon, um, and all these areas have seagrass. But we've also found juvenile fish in 
um, other seaweed habitats in shallow waters, um, up in Poole Harbour amongst um, sponge gardens. So it, they don't have to have seagrass as their nursery areas. Um, I think any, any sheltered, protected inshore area with ample food supply um, will, will serve their purpose. So it's really quite variable. Um, and so you'll find some juvenile bream very close to the nesting areas and others miles away from any known nesting areas. So I think it's, it's just lack of the draw. Um, question again from Fiona. Do you know the likelihood of the males returning to their nest sites and continuing the protection of their nest after capture? No. Um, that is a topic of, of ongoing discussion um, amongst other um, fishery managers and researchers. And it's when, when we've discussed um, looking at it, it's, it's a very um, difficult thing to measure. Um, and could be very time consuming. You, you would have to set up a very large experimental area with, with tagged, you know, you'd have to catch the fish yourselves, tag them, put sensors underwater, um, and to really capture that information for a, a representative number of fish. Um, I have anecdotal evidence from, from one piece of video in Swanage Bay, where I've got footage of a, of a male bream on his nest and he's clearly he's got a fishing hook in his mouth and he's trailing two or three feet of, of line um, wow. so he, he's he's snapped the line where the anglers caught him and he has returned to his nest but that's in you know what we don't know about that fish is how long it was fighting for um, and it was also in very shallow water so I think the prospect of successfully returning to a nest will be very variable for any individual fish depending on the depth from which it was caught um, and and how long it was fighting for and how well it was hooked and there's all sorts of factors at play um, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer but at, at the um, moment the, the best advice to give to anglers is, is to put them back i have a related question yeah. um so uh, you mentioned that there wasn't much data um, on the black bream. I was wondering if uh, the species has been a recreational species for a long while. There usually are some kind of documentation about abundance, you know, as a historical baseline or behavior. Has there, were there any fishing logs or, you know, anything recreational that could be used as a baseline? Yeah, um, if you look, if you look back, um, particularly at sites like um, Kingmere, they, they have been popular with recreational anglers for, for decades and there are um, you know there are records of people fishing for bream over the site um, you know well back into to last century um, but in terms of, of providing a, a reliable quantitative record um, it's I, th I think it's, it's difficult to do that just from recreational angling data alone um, th you know there have been studies that have looked at the um, the number of hours that are fished but again you know you can get these sorts of data perhaps from from charter skippers and some um, private boat owners which will give up that data but you won't get it from everybody hmm. um, and there, there's just there's no standard monitoring of, um, of population status um, as you would get with other fish stocks like cod and haddock and things like that so um, yeah there's, there's no reliable population data and it's it's just a shame, I, I think, that the species is it, targeted every year when it's at its most vulnerable life stage, when it's trying to reproduce, and particularly for a nesting species that guard, you know, guards the nest. Um, it, it really is quite vulnerable to, to over-exploitation. Um, right. so I, I think a, a precautionary approach mm. um, to its management is, is necessary, um, given right. that. Yeah, I don't think I can eat bream ever again. Um, uh, we have a question from Margaret Street. Um, can undulated rays change their colors depending on their surroundings? Um, they may, may be able to get darker or lighter. Um, that's not something we've specifically recorded um, on that project, but the, the actual markings themselves won't change. Um, so you know, the, the, the spots and stripes would always be there. 
if they can change color if some get darker some get lighter they might be able to but it's, it's not something we've known you know like the, the bream can change color within 20 30 seconds um but we've not we've not seen that with the rays oh breams change color right then i had no idea um no. we have a question which will probably i mean if you have any tips this would be very helpful to people who might want to do your kind of work as students. Um, the question is, how would you recommend securing work on projects like those you have participated in? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, some of those projects, um, like the, the, the Bream and Undulate Ray projects, really, they, they have started out just purely from personal interest. Um, and we've, we've developed them in our own time um, at our own cost, really, um, just to see where they would go. Um, so it's, it's very much just a, a case of, of sort of self-supported, self-guided um, project work. Others, um, like the the seagrass translocation, um, that came through, um, you know, commercially tendering for the work, um, and other other project work. Um, has, has come about through personal contacts. So it is, a lot of it is all about, you know, building up a network um, of, of contacts over time, um, getting to know people, going to conferences, talking to people, you know, and then generating your ideas um, for the work and, um, and seeing where it goes. So, um, yeah, there's no kind of one set route that the, the, these different projects I've shown you have all come about through a really varied, um, set of, of, of contacts and, and methods really um we have a fun question from yaoi have you ever been hurt by rays or any other features under the sea during your work have i ever been hurt yeah or um, any mishaps <laughs> <laughs> the i think probably the worst thing that's happened to me was a few years ago um i was diving around the farn islands off the um, Northumbrian coast and I was snorkeling well I was surface swimming back to the boat on my back and I decided to flip over onto my front um, to carry on swimming back to the boat and just as I spun around in the water I hadn't seen it but a huge lion's mane jellyfish was right behind my head and of course I was I was completely in a dry suit and gloves and everything everything was protected apart from this area around my face and of course i just went straight into this jelly oh. and and just had the worst sting around my mouth and cheeks i've ever had um and i i probably spent about two hours feeling very angry <laughs> due to the pain um and then the rest of the day on the way home um i just had it's a very strange reaction, very uncontrolled twitching in my legs <laughs> for the rest of the day. Um, so that, that's probably the worst thing. Um, otherwise, yeah, not much. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question from Eleanor Barry. What would you recommend as a good starter camera? As a good starter camera? Um, I have just bought, it's almost like I was waiting for I've just bought for, <laughs> um, for survey work um this is it's an olympus tg6 um and it, it's replaced well, i haven't got that in handy oh hang on it's over here this is the, the first few images i showed you of um of turtles and the clownfish were taken on this camera which i bought some 14 years ago now and it's it's kind of near the end of its life but it was a nice little canon compact camera but it's it's always been my go-to camera for survey work where you don't want to carry a big SLR around with you if you're trying to make notes and do other tasks. So I've got this little Olympus TG6 and it will do 4K video. It does reasonable wide angle and amazing macro work. Um, you can see spines on bryozoans, you can see hairs on shrimp's legs on it. it. It really is a great little camera and I got that earlier this summer um, and it served me very well on several surveys this year already. So I'd recommend that. Somebody's yeah. commented that Olympus announced this year that they're leaving the camera business. Yeah, oh. buy one while you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, uh, there are still a few available online, and um, I picked that up in the summer 
um, mm. with a housing for about 500 quid. Um, nice. And it, it's a great piece of kit. I have one last question um, since I've got your full attention. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I am very scared of water and that's underwater is a realm that I would never imagine myself in. So which is why it seems even more magical to me. But whereas birds, I mean, birds are way more accessible to most of the planet. Um, would you say it's harder or easier to get people's attention to conserve? Is it easier to convince them to conserve what they see or to conserve what they cannot see? I think that's, that's a really good question. I think it's, it's definitely easier to, um, to get people's attention, um, to focus on animals they can see um, and perhaps you know, even interact with um, on, on a daily basis. And that does that does make it harder, I think, for mm. marine conservation. Um, and and that that's kind of why with with this um, you know with with the Bream project and the, and the Ray project, um, giving a story to it and you know is is really key. And I remember always being taught at, at college and at university, you know, you can't anthropomorphize. Yeah. You, you know you shouldn't put these these human emotions on them but if you want people to engage with it um and 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 really get interested in it then then you have you have to put that sort of spin on it and and so that, that's what gives the bream a, you know such a such a wonderful story we you know you see different male bream on their nests will have different levels of aggression um and you've got the you know nests which you know devoid of males because they've been caught and um, you get this female interest, like you said, in making sure the nest is spick and span and <laughs> choosing their mate. You can really put these, these sort of, you know, human emotions um, yeah. into the species, which is, is key. And, it, and with the rays, um, Martin and Sheila's idea of giving them all names, um, and you know, some of them just dreadful puns. We've got Charles Ray, Billy Ray, Garay, Hilla Ray. Um, <laughs> we've been, it's getting hard. We've been through the alphabet so many times. Um, but it but it really engages with people and and um, and, and puts a, a more understandable um, aspect on 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 the species and their the stories. So um, I think yeah. it, that sort of thing is is key. Um, but it, it is difficult. It is difficult. Yeah. No, it's an interesting dis distinction. I guess the distinction you're making between anthropomorphizing and not is kind of a distinction between scientists and policy workers slash activists because. If you want people to act on it, you have to make it emotional, whereas scientists are taught to, you know, completely ignore that part of the world because they cannot yeah. get emotional about it. Yeah. Um, we have some great Blenny names here, um, Blennifer, Blenard, and you can <laughs> go on, I guess. <laughs> right. Um, it's 1.30. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, everybody else has been a great audience. Um, as I said, this would be uploaded on YouTube. Matt has a website if you have not had your enough of fish images for the day. Um, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. And we hope Thanks you'll stay much. in touch with us. Cheers. Will do. <laughs> okay. Thanks so Bye. Much. Cheers. Bye-bye.